the individual instructor that you choose is probably more important than the school you choose. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to Late Departure. I am Adam, and as some of you may know, this is my continuing journey to hopefully becoming an airline pilot sometime in the future here. And along my my late departure travels here, I had the extraordinary pleasure to meet Steve Pomroy here. Absolutely amazing guy. Got to fly with him once. And uh, actually, the first time I saw Steve was on the pilottraining.ca. You know, I was went through the slides and Steve was doing the whole section on turbines, like the turbofans and turbojets and stuff like that. So it was great to see him first there. And then when I met him in person, I'm like, oh, man, this is the guy from the video. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, but just uh, an amazing person. And uh, Steve, uh, I'll, I'll let you go ahead and just uh, introduce yourself and tell us what you do and, uh, you know, some things about you here. And uh, we'll touch on more of these things throughout our talk today. But uh, please go ahead. All right, Adam, thanks for having me here today. Um, I'm a bit of a long story, so I'll go with the short version, I guess. Um, I'm a class one instructor. And nowadays I'm doing some freelance work, um, looking for class four candidate students, but I'm also a pilot examiner. I actually spend most of my time doing flight tests uh, and I do the whole range of flight tests. I don't do instructor rides, but I do the rec, private, commercial, multi and IFR. I was at WestJet Encore there for a while. I resigned back in September. And since then I've been doing the instructing slash examining thing full time. Excellent, yeah. and. Uh, I know that with the the freelance, so we did talk about that before, and that's really going to segue nicely into the topic for today, which is uh, flight instructors, semicolon, or not semicolon, colon, <laughs> uh, are they really the most important thing when you're doing your flight training? And spoiler alert, I truly believe that they're a major thing. And I'm not sure if you've seen on Facebook these days or any of the social media, but you have so many people posting on Facebook, Reddit, uh, AV Canada, the aviation website there. And so many people are out there saying, oh, I am looking for the cheapest flight school. What's the best flight school? Uh, where can I get the best rates? What And a lot of these people have this this thought that you know just because you go to so and so flight school means that you're 100 percent guaranteed going to have an amazing experience and you know like whatever it is based on just the flight school alone that's really going to be everything and for me personally that was definitely not the case i i found that no matter what flight school whether it's some of the most reputable flight schools in the country or even smaller flight schools uh, you know, even for myself, for my PPL, I'm not sure if you know this, but I, uh, the gentleman that I was doing my flight training in Vancouver with, Ken, uh, he was over, I think, at Encore as well. And I, oh, yeah, I know, found I know him Ken. online. Yeah. You probably, yeah, I heard of Ken. Yeah, I know. Notorious Ken. Ken. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I actually met him online. And he was online and he was, you know, volunteering his time, just, you know, answering questions from people and just anyone who was curious about anything to do with aviation. You know, he was super passionate, super enthusiastic. And originally I was looking for flight schools and saying, oh, like these are the best flight schools that I found in Canada. But then I came across this guy who was just so passionate about aviation. He loves aviation. He loves flying. He loves learning about flying. And I actually ended up going to train with him in retrospect, the best thing that I've ever done, because I found out later on, you know, when, when he actually went back to the airlines, just as I'm sure you did at that point, you know, I, and I had to go with other instructors. I'm like, Oh man, like, you know, there's definitely a difference in what happens when you, you switch instructors. Like, did you have any experiences like this when you were doing your flight training back in the day? Oh God, my flight training was a long, long time ago, but it was, it was much the same. I didn't do a lot of research. There was no internet to go on to to research schools back then. I'm showing my age here. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I kind of was limited to what I could get through the grapevine. Uh, there was a reasonably good school locally to where I grew up. And so that was a school that I ultimately went to and I got lucky. I had some good instructors there, um, but I know that's not always the case. And, and you're right. The, uh, I think the point that you're you're digging at there is that the individual instructor that you choose is probably more important than the school you choose. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of merit to that argument. There's um, there's a lot of variety from instructor to instructor. And even within the same school, there's a lot of variety from instructor to instructor. 
And choosing the individual instructor will get you a lot further than choosing the school. Mm. There's not a lot of difference. You, you mentioned that a lot of people are looking for the lowest cost flight training. Flight training is as cheap as it can get. There are a lot of costs involved in delivering flight training. It doesn't get any cheaper than it is. And the price from one school to another, you're talking about a couple of percentage points, maybe. Uh, it's, it's almost, actually, not almost, it's not worth looking for the cheapest flight school. For the price difference, for the money you're going to save, it's a waste of time. You're better off looking for quality. And that quality comes more from the instructor than from the school. Yeah. And it's funny you should mention that I actually just did a, I was spreadsheeting out my flight school costs and I was talking with some other people who did the same thing from different schools across the country. And the difference was within surrounding, like, you know, like a couple, couple hundred dollars, basically. Yeah. It was out of like 25,000 or whatever it was for the PPL. Like the average was about the same and it was yeah. just, so yeah. it really doesn't matter. By yeah, the time you throw the in the are, different yeah. costs of rent and the different costs of food, the different costs of transportation, the price difference from one school to another is completely negligible. It's, it's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so, and one thing I'm so happy to be talking with you about, because I've flown with you and I know that you're an amazing knowledgeable instructor and, you know, anyone flying with you obviously is going to get the best experience that they possibly can. In terms like of that, so, yes. be, <laughs> well, in terms of your experience and just just some what you do, and maybe from uh, I guess what you've seen in the industry, what what do you would you look out for? Just knowing what you know from your experience as a flight instructor, like if you were to go back and do it again with all the knowledge that you have now, and you have this knowledge about what a good flight instructor is and what you should be looking for. Like, what would it be? What would you be looking for specifically in terms of, you know, just what kind of features or? That is so hard to answer. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I've done a lot of class one work um, and I've worked with a lot of different instructors and I've been in supervisory roles. So it's pretty easy for me to sit down with an instructor and spend time with them as, you know, as a, a role play as quote unquote student and determine if they know what they're doing or not. But for a student to do that, sitting outside the flight school it's it's a really hard thing to assess it's really difficult so what do you do you you stack the odds in your favor you, it's very difficult to make the right choice but you can stack the odds in your favor by looking for experience um and and i'm not i'm not big on this idea that you have have lots of experience to know what you're doing as a pilot but as an instructor i do support that philosophy because your main role fundamentally as an instructor is to help your students learn from your experience. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have experience, that's pretty hard to do. Mm -hmm. um, there are some foundation skills that can be taught even without a lot of experience, but ultimately if you want a really good instructor, you want somebody with lots of experience and not just experience flying, but also experience teaching because teaching is a whole other skill set. So yeah, you can be a great pilot, but you don't know how to teach. That doesn't make you a great instructor. Mm. vice versa you can be a great instructor but if you don't know what you need to know about flying then you're handicapped as an instructor you can't really communicate things that you don't know so you've got to be good at both in order to be a good instructor now finding that as a student is really hard because it's really hard to assess and it's really hard to even get the information that you need to make that assessment so the best mm. way you can stack the odds in your favor is go somewhere where uh, you you have a, a, an instructor who has lots of experience uh, which is easier said than done these days because our industry treats instructing as an entry-level job. So right off the bat, most instructors are not experienced. And by the time they get to that point where they have that experience that's really useful to students, off they go to the airlines. So it's it's a bit of a dilemma for people coming into the industry. How do I get good training? Uh, well, <laughs> that's it's easier said than done. It's out there. It exists. But uh, it's really hard to determine where you're going to get it versus where you're going to just spend a lot of money and, and struggle. Yeah, definitely. And I can also speak to sort of, I, I've had the experience of having a, like a variety of instructors over the course, because I flew 20 years ago as well when I first started. And right. uh, I came back and, you know, flew again with Ken and then a few other people. But during that time, I definitely had people from both camps, some people who were on one end really good at teaching, but didn't have that aviation background. And then some people yep. who like I've flown to some people who have amazing, like over 10,000 hours, super experienced kind of people, but uh, they wouldn't know what, you know, like, like I know how to do this, but they didn't know how to kind of. How do you communicate it to somebody that. who doesn't know it? Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's right. Like I said, it's a whole other skill set. 
Mm-hmm. And you need both to be good at your job as an instructor. You've got to have both skill sets. Uh, mm-hmm. It's much easier said than done. The idea behind the instructor course, of course, is to take somebody who knows how to fly and, and teach them how to how to teach so that they're at least competent. Even if they're not mm-hmm. expert, they can at least do a reasonable job. And, and you know, we we see a, a, some success in doing that. But I, again, I think we're handicapped by the fact that there's so much turnover and people are, are not people, the industry in, in general treats instructing as an entry-level job. And so that drives the turnover. Um, and you end up with a bit of a catch-22. If, if you're inexperienced, you're not going to get paid very well. If you're not going to get paid very well, you're not going to stick around. And if you don't stick around, you're going to get replaced by somebody who's inexperienced. Mm-hmm. And so the cycle just goes and goes. Um, and which is really unfortunate because we could see some really top quality flight training out there if we could slow that turnover rate down. But uh, it it is what it is for now, I guess. Okay. Yeah, that's, you know, I, I'd love to see a situation more like, you know, in some of the other countries where, uh, like from what I heard, especially in the EU, like in England, most of the time the people who do, do flight instructing are people who already were working commercially. Yep. They retire when they're in their 50s or something like that and come back and instruct. Yeah. Because it, even then, they can come back and instruct, and they're still going to be able to get a livable salary, and it's still yep. fairly competitive out there. But out here, like you said, it's just, uh, you know, we just don't have that much value for flight instructors, and just tends nope. to go you know, that way, yeah. And so, I, I guess another really good segue for this is because you mentioned about, uh, you know, having that experience, and because just by very the very virtue of the fact that, you know, these flight instructors, they're not sticking around long. They're getting out of there as quickly as they can. But there are, you know, experienced instructors like yourself yep. and people doing uh, freelance instructing. Uh, but I think most of the people, because it's not something you, it's really difficult to just search up like freelance instructing. There's, I know there are a lot of different rules and there are things like, for example, you know, there are rules about who can, for example, purchase an airplane, who needs to own the airplane and all these kinds of things. So what kind of solutions have you found for this that make it possible for people, you know, if they say, Hey, you know, like I want to go fly with Steve, like he's got all this experience. It looks awesome. And maybe for people like both locals and I don't know if, if you have had any students that aren't locals either, but what people may be from another country, if they're interested in that, what they might be able to do. Uh, so yeah, if you could touch on those. Yeah. Um, so the rules are, I won't say they're simple. They're, there's basically two different sets of rules. They're, if you're working on a recreational permit or a private license, you have to own the airplane. Um, mm-hmm. So that's that's a bit of an obstacle for anybody who wants a freelancer at that level. However, once you hold a private license, if you're working on a night rating or a commercial license or an instrument rating or anything beyond the private license, at that point, as, as a freelance instructor, I still can't provide you with the aircraft. However, you can get the aircraft from basically any way, anywhere. You can borrow it from a friend. You can rent it from somebody, including at a flight school. You can own your own. Uh, as long as I'm, and the term they use is arm's length. So basically, I there can't be any money changing hands between me and and whoever's providing the aircraft. That's mm-hmm. that's the short version of what that means. So you can get the aircraft basically basically from anywhere. And I've taught a couple of instructor students freelance, and they rented the airplane from a flight school. So, and that's that's legit. You can rent the aircraft from somebody who rents airplanes out and hire a freelancer and work with the freelancer once you're past the private license. If you're working on a private license, we can't do it that way. You actually have to be an owner of the aircraft. Mm-hmm. The only, actually, I shouldn't say that because there is one way out of being an owner, and that is being the director of a company if the company is the owner of the aircraft. So the short version is you, you kind of got to be an owner of the aircraft for the private license. But again, beyond the private license, as long as, as, as the instructor, as the freelance instructor, I'm at arm's length, you can get the aircraft from any source that you have access to. Okay. So that's not, that's not too bad. It's not too out of the way, you know, like it's literally at that point, just kind of a choice. And I think the other thing, and it just kind of harkens back to what we mentioned a little bit earlier about people always trying to find like the cheapest solution. They're always looking for like, what's the minimum money that I could possibly spend? Yeah. And something that I've heard a lot of people who've been like, even people who are flight students who are, you know, doing their commercial or they're like me doing the flight instructor rating or something like that. Uh, you get to a point where you learn that cheaper is not always better. And 
a lot of the times, you know, you try to save, you cut these corners, but then it ends up taking you much longer to complete something, right? Yeah, and that's that's exactly right. We think of cheaper as cost per hour, but if you stop thinking of cost per hour and look at cost per license, the numbers mm-hmm. change completely. Your your cheaper option in the cost per hour terms is often more expensive on a, on a cost per license basis. Uh, the private license especially tends to run long, and if you if you go cheap, that means you're going to see more maintenance delays, for example, because the aircraft isn't as well cared for, or mm-hmm. you're going to see other issues with instructing because the instructing isn't done as well, so it takes longer, or you know any number of things can get in the way, and you'll find that ultimately the license runs longer, which costs you more money. And you'll find that if you are willing to spend a little bit more money on a per hour basis, if you can get a more experienced instructor and a better aircraft, you can do the license in less time, and that saves you money. And it saves you time as well, of course. And time, mm-hmm. time is money. Yeah, <laughs> it's 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 kind of counterintuitive, and it's something that I know so many people they they look at that and they're the, all they see is kind of the base numbers per hour. But like you said, really, it, yeah. it's what happens. Like uh, one thing I did in the spreadsheet is I took the the total time investment and divided it down to get like what was the actual cost per hour? Like what, what was I actually spending per hour? to get all of this kind of stuff done. And, you know, for the most part, it's like you said, you end up spending more in the long run. It's the same thing. Like there, there's some things you can do uh, as a student, for example, like your frequency of flying is a big one. And you could, yes. you would likely know a lot more about this than I do, but just from my own experience, it seems like, you know, some people say, Oh, I'm going to get like, a part-time job or something like that. I'm going to fly only once every two weeks and it's going to be cheaper, you know, something like that. And that's, yeah. So (laughs) it's not, so what happens there when people try to do that? Well, you know, skills decay. So if you have a skill and you don't use it, it it decays over time. And that's especially true if it's a new skill that you just learned. So what happens is you learn something in the airplane and then you come back to the next lesson. If you come back to the next lesson, one or two days later, you move on to the next skill and you build on it. Whereas if you come back to the next lesson two or three weeks later, you're relearning the skill you learned last time. Um, and maybe it'll last a little bit longer the second time around and eventually you'll be able to move on. That's great. But you spend a lot of time on reviewing and relearning if you space out your lessons. Um, you look at the organization or the group that's the most well-known in this country for getting their license on schedule at 45 hours, it's the air cadets. Mm-hmm. And the air cadets show up with their ground school done and they do their license in six weeks, period. And if they're not done in six weeks, they go home without a license. So they, they've they got that motivation and they've got access to the resources and they're on site and they're flying all the time and they're mm-hmm. done on. Um, and the reason they're able to do that is because they're flying so frequently. They're not forgetting things between lessons. They're not spending all kinds of time on review and relearning. They're just learning and then building on that learning and then building on that learning and then building on that learning. There's no redoing things. Right. Whereas if you, if you fly infrequently, you're going to spend a lot of money and a lot of time redoing things you've already done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we see it all the time. It happens all the time because you're right. People look at the price tag on their training and they go, "Oh, what am I going to do? I got to get a job and I got to fly every week or every two weeks instead of every day." Whereas you're actually better off getting that job, stockpiling the money, and then taking your training in blocks rather than one flight at a time. Mm-hmm. I had a conversation recently, actually, with a student who's working on their private license, and I told him, "Listen." If you don't have the money to do everything at once, that's fine, but save up enough money to go solo. Get to your solo point and you know, do all that training in a big chunk. And then if you have to take a break because of financial constraints, that's fine. Take a break at that point and then come back and get to your cross country in one mm-hmm. big chunk. And then come back and get to your flight test in one big chunk of training rather than spacing out your lessons and spending a fortune because that's what will happen. You'll have to do all this review and it'll cost a lot of money and it'll take a lot of time. You're better off breaking your training up into trunks, into chunks, into licenses if you can. So do the whole private license and then take a break and then do the night rating and then take a break and then and on and on. Or if you can't even do that, that's fine. Take the private license, for example, and again, break it into chunks, large chunks. So get to solo first. And then if you have to take a break, take a break and then get to your cross country. And if you have to take a break then, okay, and then get to your flight test. So you now got your license broken into three pieces. There'll still be a little bit of review cost in there, but it won't be anywhere near as bad as spacing out all of your lessons and flying every couple of weeks. 
Yep. And, uh, and it also wears on you too. You know, if you're spacing out yeah. these lessons and you have to go back and you just did, you know, exercise six, seven, eight or something like that. And if yeah. you go back and do it again yeah. and, uh, like that was it, my it, 20 years ago. Yeah. yeah. It kills your motivation. I'm, yep. I'm just spinning my wheels here. I'm not getting anywhere. I'm spending all this money and putting all this time and I'm, I'm not moving forward. Uh, it's just, it's murder on the motivation. It is. I, I basically got 39 hours in over about three years. Yeah. And, it, and I'm going to guess you didn't that, get very far. I can't, <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't get, yeah, I, I barely got halfway through it. And I was just like, you know what, this isn't working. I gotta, I gotta get a job and save some money so that I can get back into this and actually do this at once because this isn't working. And it was, it was too bad, but you know, I was young and I was naive and hopeful. I was at the young ripe age of like 17, 18. And I thought, you know what, it's fine. I'll just push through it, push through it. Uh, working yep. on the ramp for, 350 an hour <laughs> there <laughs> it just it didn't work right so no, yeah it doesn't. yeah it doesn't i uh when i i went through the cadet program i mentioned the air cadets earlier i actually went through the cadet program for my private license and then i i of course worked my way through the commercial license and i kind of learned that lesson i i drove a cab for a year and that was how i paid for a large chunk of my commercial license but it was kind of the same it was fly once a week and and try to time build and try to get some training in there and, and at the end of the year i was like no this isn't working I'm going to take the money I've saved and I'm going to finance the rest and get this done and get out in the workforce. And that was a good call at the time. That was a good decision. Uh, granted, debt is a bit of a killer, but not being in the workforce is even worse. Mm -hmm. right? So if someone is training for a commercial license, it's the same philosophy applies. If you're only flying every couple of weeks, not only does that take a long time because you're spacing out your flights, it also takes a long time again because you're you're doing a lot of review work. And it's, that drives up the financial costs as well. So the way to do it is to save up your money, whether you've got a job that allows you to save the money or whether you're going to bite the bullet and get financing. Either way, have a chunk of money and do a chunk of training. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, I think that's, that's the best advice. And if more and more people could do that, you know, yeah. I, I mention this every once in a while. It's it's sad, but, you know, I people went on to my YouTube channel and they saw what I was doing and and they got in touch with me. And I think it was, it was at least four or five people over the past I think about six months or so. And they sent me emails or messages and said, hey, I ran out of money, like in the middle of my training. What do I do? Like, I don't know what to do. And, and that's the thing, like they, they hadn't saved up the money to start with. And then some of them decided, you know, they'd get a job. Some of them ran out of steam, had to go like back home or do whatever they had to do there to, to go back and make money. But the long story short is it almost never works out well if you don't, you know, get it kind of ready or yeah. do it all at once so that you can yeah. get to the career or like make some money on it. Right. Yeah. And if yeah. you don't, if you can't do it all at once, okay, sit down with your instructor and pick milestones and yeah. break it. In. And so get to that milestone and then take your break and save more money and then get to the next milestone and take a break and save more money. That works as well. It's not as ideal as doing everything at once, but it's much, much mm -hmm. better than spacing out your flights. Exactly. Yeah. And I think another thing that I'd really like to touch on here, it's one thing to, you know, to be very excited and come into your flight training and, and start your flight training and, you know, be really into it. But there are things that I know just from my experience here that flight instructors are looking for in terms of, of their expectations from the students, because I, I do know that you know, like there are some things like students, some of them, you know, they might be really into flying, but, you know, they might be coming in late or they're not doing the work beforehand. And so, like, what kind of things for you as an instructor do you want to see from a student? Because I'm sure it's not always the fact that, you know, the student might think, oh, like my flight instructor, you know, they're, they don't really care about me or something like that. But I feel like there's also the opposite of that where, or the, I guess the devil's advocate here where they don't really consider that, you know, they're not doing stuff that's making the instructor invested in their training as well. So it kind of goes both ways. Right. So what does yeah. the instructor inspect? What do you inspect expect from your students? You know, there's a lot of little things, but it all boils down to show up prepared. Um, and that sounds kind of trite, but really that's what it is. If you show up prepared, your instructor is going to be really happy about that. And it's going to make your learning a lot smoother. And, and what does that mean? It means doing the reading. It means doing the studying. It means doing the assignments. Um, and it doesn't just mean doing random reading. You need to do targeted readings specific to whatever you're going to do in this lesson. And if you don't know what those targeted readings are, that's fine. Get that from your instructor. 
So when your instructor gives you a debriefing on a lesson, if they're not assigning you homework, ask for homework. Mm -hmm. um, and they can tell you, hey, you know what? Next time we're going to do this exercise and this exercise, here's what you need to read. And try and answer these questions as well while you're reading. So now you've got an assignment. Now you can do more than that if you want. If you're motivated, that's great. But there's a certain bare minimum that you have to do. And it really comes down to the fact that the airplane is a terrible, terrible classroom. I don't know if you've <laughs> noticed that. Maybe you have. Yep. Um, it's not really obvious when you're first learning how to fly. But after you've been at it for a while, and especially if you start teaching for a while, you come to understand that the airplane is not a good classroom. So you really have to learn most of what you need on the ground through self-study or through briefings or through ground school or through more self-study. That, that really is a cornerstone. But ultimately, when you get in the airplane, really what you're trying to do is apply what you've already learned. So there's some physical skills that you can't learn on the ground that you have to learn in the classroom. And there's some context that you get out of the airplane that you don't really get out of a book. But most of what you need to know is in the books. And if you can show up prepared for your lesson, you'll find that the lesson goes a lot smoother. And if it matters to you, your instructor is going to be a lot happier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And having that that preparedness, it, it's just such a big thing. And I, I think that's also yeah. something that people don't, I, I guess going into it, there's sort of a, a fantasy that, you know, flight training, it's all about jumping in this plane and going into the wild blue yonder. And no. people don't <laughs> always consider that, you know, like a big chunk of what flight training is, is on the ground. It's, it's yeah. that study, it's that preparation. It's, it's making yeah. sure you understand the concept and you do your homework before you step into that plane. Right. Yeah. There's a perception out there. If you talk to a lot of people that military training, for example, is a lot better than civilian training. And I've done military training. I've taught for the Air Force before I was at WestJet. That's what I was doing. And a large part of the reason, and not the only reason, but a large part of the reason why, why their training is, in fact, better is because the onus is placed on the student to show up prepared. Mm -hmm. So when we would do briefings, for example, uh, when you start teaching and you start briefing your students, you're going to spend a lot of time teaching, teaching attitudes and movements, teaching straight and level, teaching spins, teaching forced approaches. Whereas in the Air Force, their philosophy is, you show up for a briefing and you assess whether or not the student has already taught this to themselves out of the books we gave them. And if they haven't, you mm -hmm. kick them out. Mm -hmm. right? You send them to the major to get yelled at for a while. And they come back the next day prepared. Um, and, and the briefings are very heavy on asking questions and not telling anything. And you confirm that the learning has already been done and the student has actually showed up prepared. And then you get in the airplane and you put everything into practice and the learning is very effective because the students are under that, that I don't know, well, I guess it is, it's pressure to show up prepared um, and the onus is on them and they understand that the onus is on them to show up prepared. And it makes a huge difference. The training goes way smoother and it goes way faster. And at the end of the day, in my opinion, it's, it's higher quality training, but a lot of it comes down to that individual student preparation for individual lessons. For sure. And it's, yeah, it's something that I, I tell all the people who are coming to me, asking me what they should do to get ready for flight training and stuff like that. And most of them can't believe me when I say, you know, it's going to be a lot of study, but yeah. yeah, having that preparation. And unfortunately we don't have a major <laughs> lying around to <laughs> kind of yell at people and get them into shape there. So people, but I think the thing that people should understand though, and again, I've talked with a bunch of flight instructors and, you know, there, there is a such thing as, you know, a flight instructor also getting demotivated, you know, when you have a student that, again, isn't prepared, yes. that isn't coming on on time. Yeah. Uh, and how do you deal with that as like a freelance instructor? Because you don't have like the the CFI that you can say, hey, this person's not doing this. We need to really sit down and have a talk with them. Like it, it well, must be a what? challenge for you, too, right? <laughs> as a freelancer, I basically am my own CFI. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got I basically sit down and I assess what to do here. And if it's I haven't actually had to deal with this firsthand. I haven't had a student mm -hmm. who isn't motivated, but at the end of the day, I think I just fired them. Um, obviously not, not right away. You know, I'm going to investigate and see if there's an issue. You know, is there a problem at home that you need to deal with and then come back to me? Or are you really not sure what to do? Do I need to provide you with more guidance? But after I've, you know, checked the boxes and, and seen if any of those issues can be resolved, if the student just isn't motivated and isn't interested in doing the work, well, I'm going to find another student and you're going to have to find another instructor. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, you know, I've been down that road where I'm at, a, where I'm at a flight training unit, and it's my job, and I have to work with that student. It's not that much fun. If you have a student who's showing up unprepared. It's, it's, it becomes a job very fast, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, it's, it's a bit of a slog to work through that. You kind of you roll with it, but 
what do you do? You go talk to your CFI and say, here's an issue. Can we please deal with this? But as a freelancer, you know, I, I'll check all the boxes to see if I if this is an issue I can resolve. And if it isn't, if it's just truly a motivation or a level of interest issue, then I'm passing the student on to somebody else. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's just what you got to do. I think <laughs> yeah, it, it just drags you down, right? It, does, it does. doesn't feel good. It does, yeah. Yeah, if you're constantly pushing to get work done and, and they're just not interested, yeah, it's not fun at all. Yeah, I well, I came off of before this teaching, you know, university classes, and I'd, I'd have situations. You know, you'll have situations where you have some students that just aren't interested in learning, and it's really unfortunate. But I think more so as a teacher, for myself, I just lose. I lose my own motivation, like my whole reason to yeah. be there. And like, it's really rewarding being a teacher. That's something that I love being about a teacher. But yeah. at the same time, if the students aren't interested in learning, if they're not interested in doing the work, it can also be extremely it's kind of devastating as, as an instructor. Or a teacher. Yeah. How much energy do you want to put into teaching a student who's not interested when over here you've got another student who is interested and can use your time? Mm -hmm. um, that's That's an easy choice in my mind. Right. Yeah. And I, I, so I guess uh, I, I don't want to take up your whole day here. I want to make sure we <laughs> also get to some stuff that you want to do. Uh, but I guess just wrapping up, uh, what we'll do is uh, I want to ask you one last question here, and then uh, we'll we can talk a bit about uh, the instructorpilot.ca and studentpilot.ca a little bit and sort of what sure. you're doing there as well. Yeah. Before we get on to that, I, uh, one thing that I love to hear from people is what was your initial passion or impetus or motivation to get into flying what is it about flying that captivates you what is it about it that that just makes you love what you do you know i don't know <laughs> and that's somebody made the comment one time if you don't know you can't know um and I, I guess maybe that's it if you don't know you can't know it's i just like flying i like technology too i like the technical side of flying um and maybe that just comes, I have an engineering background as well. So maybe it comes from that or maybe they're related somehow. But yeah, I mean, it's people talk about how it's it's very liberating or it's very, there's a lot of freedom when you're in the airplane, when you're flying. And that's, that's all true. There's great scenery. That's true. Uh, work is different every day. That's not entirely true, but it's mostly true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you get to see the world or at least the country. That's true. So there's a lot of things to be said for it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which one can I actually hang my hat on? I, I don't know. And I've thought about it over the years and I, I really don't know. I just, I just like it. And I can't really clearly articulate why. Like I said, somebody made the comment one time, if you don't know, you can't know. And, and I think there might be something to that. That's right. There's, there's something, there's something there that we haven't developed a word for yet. You know, <laughs> exactly. there's, that there's something, but I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember when people were saying, oh, yeah, I, I want to fly, you know, for that sense of freedom. And then I started flying yeah. around Vancouver airspace. <laughs> That's not for free, is it? <laughs> I'm like, what is happening here? Like, you have to, like, you're in these nooks and crannies of airspace trying to figure out, like, where you can go and get controllers yelling at you from every direction that you're busting every single type of airspace imaginable. And, yep. yeah, it's uh, it's definitely something else there. But, okay, so, and so tell, tell us a little bit about uh, about instructorpilot.ca and uh, studentpilot.ca and what, what you're doing with those. Okay, well, instructorpilot.ca is very simple. It's, it's it's really just an online brochure about me. And so it's mm -hmm. the website that I use to, to advertise and to communicate with my students. So my schedule is on there and there's a bunch of information, resume type information on there. So it's really just, it's a way of getting the word out there that, hey, hey, everybody look at me. I'm available as a freelance instructor. Um, mm -hmm. And I can basically teach anything fixed one. I'm trying to think if there's anything like, oh, I can't teach the float rating. I don't have, I don't have my 50 hours of floats. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I can't teach. Mm -hmm. Everything else, private, commercial, multi, IFR, instructor rating. And instructor rating is actually what I'm trying to focus on, but I'm able to do basically anything. Um, and likewise with the flight tests, I'm actually not doing instructor flight tests, but I'm doing all the other flight tests. So, so okay. instructorpilot.ca is pretty simple. It's just, it's, it's a brochure about, you know, here I am. This is what I do. Please contact me if you're interested. Uh, mm -hmm. Studentpilot.ca is a little bit more. Right now, it's just online courses. There's a couple of online courses that are live and available. Uh, one is free. The other two are behind paywalls. Um, and I've got six or eight other courses that are in development. Mm -hmm. uh, two of them are actually very well developed. I, I, I was contracted with a college in Edmonton to build 
aviation physics and aviation math courses for them. And those mm. courses, the math course is basically done. There's a couple of little uh, details that it needs filled in, but the physics course is still a work in progress. Mm -hmm. Other courses I've got in there, I've got an exam prep course, a written exam prep course that's up and live, and I've got a flight mm -hmm. test course that's currently under development. I've got an instructor course under development. PPL Ground School is kind of being done piecemeal. I'm doing a P-Star course and a radio course. There's already mm -hmm. a live course on uh, flight instruments, which you know mm -hmm. I'm going to take all these pieces when they're done and maybe assemble them into a private pilot ground school and, and so on with other courses. I'm trying not to focus on just ground schools not because i don't want to i actually really like to but there's already a lot of competition in that space there's a lot of people doing it already and it's not a really right. big market. so when you look at the amount of work that goes into building one of these courses it's uh, as much as i'd like to do it it's kind of hard to justify putting all that energy and time into it if it's if it's already out there so much mm -hmm. uh, you already mentioned pilottraining.ca that's where you've done a lot of your training i guess or your ground training anyways mm -hmm. Um, they're a big one, of course, but they're not the only one. There's a few others out there doing the same thing. And like mm -hmm. I said, it's not a huge market. So I'm trying to focus yeah. on other things that aren't out there. So again, my my written exam course, there's nothing out there like my written exam course. It's it's an exam mm -hmm. prep course in school. Same thing with the flight test prep course that I'm building. It doesn't exist out there at all right now. So I'm hoping that, that hopefully I can get some traction with that and it'll be useful to students. Um that's a lot about the courses that I'm building, but my plan with the, the website is to have a lot more. I want to have, you know, a bulletin board and and uh, an advice column and maybe an e-zine with a bunch of other instructors from across the country contributing. Uh, and maybe not just instructors, maybe also pilots from other parts of the industry. So the plan eventually is to build that website into a full comprehensive go-to location for student pilots. We're not there yet. There's a lot of development work that has to be done, but that's that's the goal, medium term. Excellent. Oh, it yeah. sounds great. I look forward to seeing that because there's, you know, other than <laughs> Av Canada, which half the time is just people trolling each other with uh, <laughs> yeah. random stuff and insults and stuff like that. You know, it's it's yeah. hard to get that kind of information when you're just searching for stuff, right? And that's yes. one of the reasons yeah. why I made the YouTube channel, just to touch on a few topics here and there. But then again, I'm just, you know, I'm just a flight student. I'm not, uh, not in any way well, sure yeah. but that's that's still a valid <laughs> yeah. perspective there's a lot of people coming into aviation as students and they want their perspective of other students who have already done some or most of their training and and you've mm -hmm. got that offer them that that's the hope <laughs> just doing <laughs> what meager the little thing that i can in the process but and so for any of these students here so anyone who's uh listening or watching this who's wondering so how do i like where where is Steve Pomroy? Like where do I have to go if I want to do some lessons and uh, like uh, your contact and stuff? I'll make sure it, it'll be visible somewhere here on on the thing already. But yep. uh, just where where do they have to go? Where should they be to to learn? Well, from I, if they want to go. I do online do work. I do online yeah. work, so I work through Zoom. Um, mm -hmm. So instructorpilot.ca. If somebody wants to go there, my email is available. They can contact me. There's also a contact form if they prefer not to email. That's fine. That works. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of where I am physically, I'm in Portage the Prairie, which is in southern Manitoba, and I, mm -hmm. I'm portable, so I move around southern Manitoba. I do flight tests and training all over. Uh, I won't say the southern half. The southern half is a lot, basically from Gimli south. Uh, mm -hmm. I go as far north as Gimli and, and from border to border, east to west. So all of basically southern Manitoba is, is my domain. So anybody who's in that region and wants to do some face-to-face -face training, whether it's in the classroom or in the airplane, I'm available for it. Excellent. Well, that's wonderful. So yeah, I, I have no doubt. And like we said earlier, you know, it's amazing to have instructors with experience and, you know, you could go to a flight school and gamble to see, you know, if you'll get, uh, you'll get someone maybe experienced, maybe you'll get someone fresh off their rating or something like that. Or, you know, you could uh, get a look, take a look at in the freelance direction where, yeah. like we said, you know, you, it, the cost might be slightly more, but then in the long run, you know, you're looking at more of a personalized program, I know yep. for you, like you're, you're not going to be like uh, one of the guys who's juggling like 35 students and can barely <laughs> spend any time. I know that, I know that you, you have like a lot of dedication and attention to your students, which, which I think is wonderful. Yep. So yeah, it's uh, it definitely something give uh, Steve a shout and uh, you can contact him by all those means you just mentioned. 
And uh, other than that, there's just wonderful talking with you about this, Steve. I think it's great that we were able to, to take a look at this because, like I said, a lot of people just think, oh, yeah, cheapest school, best school, something like that. But really, yeah, instructor really is so important. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I agree. And happy to be here. Excellent. All right. Well, I hope you have a great rest of your day here. And remember, everyone, <laughs> it's never too late. See you next time.